Somewhat agitated, the woman enters the room. She's wearing a dress from the early 20th century, which she nervously adjusts. It might be worth giving her long and dark hair some attention, though. Today, it'll be taking part in her husband's experiment. Her husband notices she's agitated and whispers something consoling in her ear. But the woman's thoughts are completely occupied by the current display. She's worried both for herself and for her husband, who will soon present his invention to an audience. While the room is being prepared, the woman looks out the window onto a street full of people and dreams about what her husband might achieve. Then they would be able to offer their services to numerous clients and the family business would bring in profit. Finally, the hall fills with people and her husband invites her to follow him to her respected place. The woman gets very nervous after seeing the spectators. The procedure, which she and her husband will now demonstrate, is quite unprecedented, although they've practiced it many times. After their experiments, the woman had been left with burns on her head. It had already healed, but all the same, she routinely touches her head in those places where the burns were. Coming to her senses, she lowers her hand and tries to concentrate on what her husband is saying. Everyone listens to him attentively, and the woman feels proud of her husband. But the meaning of his words is wasted on her. Her thoughts are absorbed by what will happen now. Everyone's gaze turns to her, and the woman understands that her husband has just introduced her to those gathered. She herself missed half of what he said. Agitated, her husband points at the specially placed armchair, where the woman neatly sits. She still can't stop herself from wincing for a second, and, sighing quietly, opens her eyes. She looks at those gathered and puts on a smile. She has to look confident, showing everyone that the procedure is more pleasant and easy than it might appear. A machine is brought into the room, and the woman, after seeing it, starts shaking. A multitude of narrow cylinders protrude from it. Her husband explains to the crowd that this machine is for curling hair, and his spouse will serve as a model for demonstrating the machine in action. The woman feels the pins being taken from her hair, and her hair falls freely down her back. Her husband begins to comb it carefully with his hands. All this time, the woman is attempting to smile. Soon, she winces at the sharp chemical smell of the special paste that is applied to her hair. The woman starts to pity her hair. After the last few procedures, it came to look lifeless. No sort of mask could return the hair to its former shine, and its brittleness had made no sign of disappearing. But the woman is firmly resolved to support her spouse. What's more, their acquaintance began from the time the experiment had started. She had served as a guinea pig for his experiments. Finally, the paste has been applied, and that means the next part has come. The woman involuntarily grips the fabric of her dress while thinking of the stage. Her eyes move quickly between the faces of those gathered. Someone looks at her with interest, someone else with unassuredness, and another person, exhausted by the preparatory stage, has already dozed off. The woman's smile has already brought out her cheekbones and hurt her lips. Her husband explains to those gathered that the machine's cylinders for curling will be heated to 100 degrees Celsius. A gasp of surprise comes from those who've come to watch. The woman winces when her first strand of hair spirals around the red-hot rollers. The smell of chemicals grows stronger. After several minutes, all her hair is spiraled round the red-hot cylinders, which end in wiring. Several people in the hall open their mouths in astonishment. The man, laughing, tells the public that the spectacle looks like torture, but couldn't be further from it. As her hair is heated, his wife's scalp will be cooled. While the procedure goes on, he tells them how the idea of such a unit came to him. One time he noticed that blades of grass will twine when exposed to heat and moisture, and this observation pushed him to the invention. The woman waits patiently. She knows this story, and the end of the procedure worries her the most. She doesn't know what'll happen to her hair. Maybe they've messed up somewhere with the chemical paste or left her locks in too long, so her wonderful hair would be hopelessly burnt. Time passes, unbearably slowly although the woman tries not to show her discomfort. She kindly answers questions from the audience and flashes a smile to those in the room. Finally, her husband announces that the procedure is almost complete and everyone can now evaluate the result. Those sitting in the hall come to life and those who had drifted off wake up and look at her. The woman herself could not resist the intrigue. The procedure lasted almost five or six hours. All this time she had sat tensely and now her eyes were stuck together with sleep. All her body has gone numb, so she's waiting impatiently for when she'll be released from the machine's grip. Finally, she's free, and surprise and ecstasy appear on the faces of spectators. Now her head is covered with breathtaking curls. People applaud and congratulate her and her husband. 
The woman is very tired, but glad that everything has turned out okay. She turns to her husband and sees that he too is smiling. After embracing, they pose and respond to questions. But the most interesting piece of information is still to come for the public. Because after a week, the woman's curls will not have returned to their former state. They won't straighten out even after a month or two. Only half a year after the procedure will the curls adopt their former shape. The demonstration of the chemical curling has gone wonderfully. Their London demonstration of the invention fared well and caught on very well. The permanent curling machine was to the people's taste, which couldn't be said of rival hairdressers. The woman knows that competition isn't satisfied with the invention. If their client's curls will hold up several months or a year, then who'll come to them every day for hairstyling? Ladies will stop visiting the hairdresser even once a week, and salon owners will lose their profits. But all these thoughts didn't occupy the woman's head for long. She didn't want to tarnish her husband's triumph with them, whose business would be booming. The woman we're talking about is Katharina Leibel, the wife of the hairdresser, Carl Ludwig Nessler, who patented his method of hair curling and its corresponding device. The overall weight of the hair rollers, which curled her locks of hair, was nearly nine kilograms. The hair was fixed in such a position for five to eight hours. Moreover, the red hot rods, about 12 inches long, were tied to an electrical device. The craftsmen paid close attention so that their client's hair didn't come into contact with the red hot elements. Sometime during the first experiment, Katarina received a burn and received two blisters on her head. Over time, Nestler improved his machine and made a big fortune. Due to the outbreak of the First World War, he was forced to flee to America, where he also took his machine. He changed his name to the better sounding name Charles and opened a production works company in the USA for a compact curling machine designed for use at home. As a result, Nestler became a millionaire and had 500 people working for him. Among his clientele was even Thomas Woodrow Wilson's wife, who flew in specially from Washington for the procedure, paying more than $100 for the session. Another invention from the former world of beauty, which would leave modern women in shock, was a machine for getting rid of freckles. At the start of the 20th century, aristocratic paleness was in fashion, and any spots on the face were considered a blemish. In 1930, Dr. M. Matarasso, an Italian doctor, presented a procedure which then and there won the heart of many a woman. They weren't stopped even by what resembled medieval torture. They applied carbon dioxide to the client's skin, after which they cut out their freckles with a scalpel. Meanwhile, the woman's eyes were covered with safety goggles. Her nostrils were also plugged up, so she had to breathe through a tube. Such a procedure was quite painful, and after it, her skin healed over several weeks. Yet another terrifying beautification technique was the hair dryer, or rather its prototype, which was shown to the world by the French hairdresser Alexandre Ferdinand Godfroy. The device's form was similar to a chef's hat and was attached to a gas tube which blew out warm air. The invention was very noisy, clunky, and of course, not at all similar to modern hair dryers. On the outside, it barely resembled them. This ancient hair dryer was popularly used by women since it correctly dried hair and there were no other household appliances to replace it. Modern women would also refuse Elizabeth Arden's Vienna Youth Mask, which was made from paper mache, covered with foil and attached to a special machine. In this case, to heat the skin, perform facelifts and revitalize, electric current was used. Arden was inspired by the tales of soldiers from the First World War. At that time, injured muscles and nerves were heated using electric impulse. Arden believed that current could help improve blood circulation in the client's facial regions and, as a consequence, revitalize them. In the 1930s, the founder of the company, Max Factor, let an audience judge an invention of his called the Beauty Calibrator. The construct resembled a mix between a futuristic helmet and a mask. It allowed them to measure the proportions of the face so they could then be corrected. This invention of Max Factors, who did makeup for Hollywood stars, laid the foundations for modern contouring, changing the face's visual aspect with the help of light and shadow. It's interesting that the creator of the famous brand used makeup himself at one point. In actuality, he was called Maximilian Faktorowicz, and he was born in modern-day Poland in a family with many children. At the early age of seven, he sold oranges and peanuts in the foyer of a theater. It was probably there that his love for actors and makeup was born. When he grew up, he became a makeup assistant at the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow. 
and then opened his own cosmetic shop with products he manufactured himself. Later, he was invited to St. Petersburg. There, Max Factor worked with actors from the Imperial Theater and became a personal makeup assistant to Nikolai II's family. He dreamed of traveling overseas but couldn't receive permission from the emperor. Then, according to rumors, he resorted to trickery. He applied heavy makeup to his face and came to an agreement with a doctor. The doctor confirmed he had an illness and Max Factor set off for supposed treatment and Carl Lavoie Vary, traveling to Los Angeles from there. Finally, an unbelievably extreme type of technology for beauty treatment was hair removal via x-ray. In the 19th century, a girl couldn't get married if she had too much hair on her body. At the start of the 20th century, the American Albert Geyser proposed his own method of solving this problem, an x-ray machine. So that hair wouldn't start growing again, clients were given a high-dose radiation. The side effects of such a beautification technique were thickening of the skin, pigmentation, and other not very pleasant consequences. The face was particularly sensitive to radiation, so clients often suffered from dermatitis. One time, a music teacher requested the hair be removed from his arms and back, and he demanded results in a very short space of time. In the end, his hair was gone after the fourth procedure, but in exchange, he earned pathological reddening of the skin on his left forearm. What unusual beautification techniques have you heard about? Share in the comments below and don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel if the video was to your liking.